So yes, welcome everybody to our first uh, in the 2023 B Biogeography and Systematics Talks. This is hosted by the Packer Lab at York, York University and the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University. My name is Victoria McPhail. I'm the coordinator of the BC unit. And I'm happy to help introduce this talk and get this talk started. So as you're probably aware, this is actually part of a series. So every month we have a different presentation by a different expert from around the around the globe, literally. And so we encourage you to sign up for the different talks as they are available. And you check out a website, yorku.ca slash bees slash packer to get more information with the upcoming talks. As this is a webinar, we actually have uh, different controls in place to try to limit who is talking. So only panelists can turn their camera and microphones on, but all the different attendees are welcome to use the chat box or the Q&A box uh, to share comments or questions. So we encourage you to use the Q&A box. You can see from the bottom of your screen, there's those are two conversation bubbles. I click on that and you put your questions in there. And at the end, we'll have the question period. We'll ask questions to Dr. Wood. Um, we also put some general questions or queries in the chat box though. If you have any questions, you can message me uh, through email or through the chat box. And this presentation will be recorded and posted online later. So I encourage you to sign up to our follow our YouTube channel to get notifications whenever new talks are posted. I do want to acknowledge that many Indigenous nations have long standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses, campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis peoples. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples, and we acknowledge the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampan Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now this is a global audience today, so we encourage you to consider about where you are joining in from, whether it's from here in Canada, perhaps Southern Ontario, or again, anywhere around the globe. And so this website, www.native-land.ca, actually works globally. So I encourage you to check out the region you're in, and reflect back as to who is on the land traditionally and who is there um, currently. The next slide here. Oh, there we go. I want to turn it over to Dr. Lawrence Packer to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, we're expecting 20 centimeters of snow between now and this time tomorrow morning here in uh, jolly old Toronto. So it might be difficult for me to get in for the work to give my lecture tomorrow morning. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Thomas Wood. He is a postdoctoral fellow currently based at the University of Mons in Belgium in the laboratory of Denis Michel, who some of you may remember from a talk he gave on Molidids last year. Um, his background is in bee ecology, having completed his PhD in the, United, in the United Kingdom, used to be part of Europe, that country, on farmland bee ecology, and then having worked in the US in agricultural systems in Michigan. He currently works on the ecology and taxonomy of wild bees with a strong focus on, Drina, on Andrina, which is the topic of his talk today. His current research involves revising the Andrina of the Western Mediterranean, quantifying their dietary niches in order to answer questions related to ecological specialization. But he also works more broadly across the Western and increasingly the Eastern Palearctic. So he's one of these optimistic people who takes on really large challenges, such as Andrinus, I think mean, second largest bee genus in the world. All right, so with no further ado, I'll pass you over to Tom. Yes, thank you very much, Lawrence, for the introduction. Um, so hopefully everybody can now see, see the screen. Yeah, looks good. And just for reference, can you see my mouse in case I need to yes, point I can. something out? Okay. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for uh, for attending. So yes, I'd like to I'd like to talk a bit about Andrina and some of the um, work that I've been doing, uh, and all of the problems associated with 
as Lawrence says, revising an extremely large B genus. Um, so Andrina uh, are a group of entirely solitary bees. In many ways, their ecology is very simple, um, no social behavior, and they all nest in the ground. So you don't need to deal with the diversity of life histories found in megachylids. Um, there's about 1,700 species at the moment. We'll discuss this more. Um, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a very good chance that you have many Andrina in your local area. And uh, they are known for their taxonomic complexity. And we'll get on to uh, some of the reasons behind that as we go through the talk. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, familiar with Andrina, um, females are generally easy to recognize um, because they have these very conspicuous uh, foveae, these little uh, pits or channels adjacent to the compound eyes that are usually filled with um, bright um, hairs. So very easy to recognize the genus, but recognizing individual species, of course, is more challenging. Um, I don't need to give much of an introduction to the higher classification of Andrina, um, because we've uh, actually had, after many years of having no uh, phylogeny at all, um, last year there were two phylogenies of uh, the family Andrenidae published um, by Pisanti and colleagues and uh, Bossett and colleagues. And um, a couple of um, months ago, I think six months ago, uh, the two of them gave uh, a talk as part of this seminar series. So uh, if you want to read, watch more about Andrina um, and their evolution at a family level, then you should go and watch that talk on YouTube. Um, so to give a very quick recap, um, there was a very good consensus between these two studies. Um, looking at the, the phylogeny of the subfamily Andrenine, in which Andrina are obviously found. Um, basically, there was uh, an origin in South America, in the Neotropics, before the group moved. Some members of the group moved into North America, into the Nearctic. And so the basal genera with Andrenine are exclusively found in the New World. And then um, an ancestor of Andrina and uh, its sister genera Cubiandrina um, moved into the old world um, and Andrina uh, arose about 25 million years ago. Uh, this is the phylogeny of Pisanti et al. And then the phylogeny of, of Bosset et al. Um, found essentially the same thing. Uh, we again have uh, a new world origin for the subfamily. We have a collection of exclusively new world genera. The topology is a little bit different, but the conclusion is essentially the same. Um, and again, about 25 million years ago, uh, we have the origin of Andrina um, splitting off from their sister genera, Cubiandrina. Sister genus, Cubiandrina. Uh, the Cubiandrina, uh, Another species poor, a very species poor lineage. Uh, there are currently only three species known. Um, they're generally quite squat bees with a very long oxal occipital distance, and they're easy to separate from, from Andrina. Um, currently, the genus is known only from the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this is the distribution map of Andrina cubiceps, or Cubi Andrina cubiceps. Um, the second species, Andrina. Uh, Cubicepsella, put the wrong uh, wrong name there, Andrina Cubicepsella. It's found only in the Anatolian Highlands. And then there's one more species which is also known from the Anatolian Highlands. So the genus is generally strongly concentrated on Turkey. So about 30 million years ago, the ancestor of Andrina and Cubiandrina moved into the old world. Uh, we cannot say definitively whether um, Andrina evolved in the old world or the new world because uh, whatever ancestor of Cubiandrina and Andrina uh, where it was, it's gone extinct. So we can't answer that conclusively, but given the um, species richness of Cubiandrina focused on Turkey, it's highly likely that the East Mediterranean and Turkey is the center of origin for this genus. So we have good consensus that Andrina are monophyletic. Uh, 
Um, and actually, the, both of these studies, almost no work was needed at a generic level. Um, Subgeneric classification remains problematic. You should watch um, Gideon Pisanti's section on the YouTube talk to learn more about subgeneric problems. And only QB Andrina needed to be moved out of the genus Andrina. We cannot find the um, exact geographical location, but Turkey is, in my opinion, the likely center of diversification. And all of the sister genera to Andrina are very species poor. There are four, uh, four sister genera containing uh, 11 species in total, which stands in extremely stark contrast to Andrina itself. Um, this is uh, the most comprehensive work totaling um, the number of species in Andrina. This is the work of Gusen Leitner and Schwarz that was published in 2002, so just over 20 years ago. And they calculated a, a total of uh, 1,454 species of Andrina. Uh, they published an update in 2005, and a very large amount of work has been, has been done since then. Um, based, on, uh, based on this work and ongoing taxonomic revisions, I calculate by the end of this year, there will be uh, nearly 1,700 species. In terms of the species totals I'm going to present in this talk, they are up, they include the uh, changes that I'm going to publish uh, this year. So they don't quite match um, the existing totals in the literature, but I thought it would be good to give you uh, the most up-to-date or slightly future uh, results. So an incredibly large genus relative to its species poor sister lineages, a nuclear bomb of speciation. And in terms of biogeography, um, the species is almost, species, the genus is almost entirely restricted to the northern hemisphere. Um, so we have in, uh, in the New World, we have about 550 species currently recognized, extending south to, uh, to Panama, where I think there are still only two species recognized. There's very mysterious Andrina brasiliensis, described by Vachal from Brazil, which I don't think anyone knows what it is. I couldn't find any type material in Paris, so it remains a mystery as to whether Andrina are in South America, but currently I don't think so. Um, the genus is largely stopped by the Sahara. Um, there are a couple of um, populations in, for example, the mountains of Ethiopia in East Africa and South Africa, um, but generally there are very few Andrina species in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you same picture in the um, Indo-Malaya region where you have a few isolated populations, for example, in the Western Ghats in India uh, or in the highlands of Malaysia. Um, but the vast, vast diversity, over a thousand species, will be found across the, the Palearctic region. And uh, three kind of major hotspots would be uh, Southwestern North America, uh, the Western Mediterranean, and the Eastern Mediterranean to, to Iran. Uh, Central Asia um, is actually remarkably species poor. Um, there are only about 260 species known from the, uh, the Stans, so uh, the classical Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. It's clear that more taxonomic work is needed here, but um, the diversity is not as high as you might expect, and so I do not consider it to be a hotspot. Uh, in terms of diversity and density, just to give you again some, some context, um, if we look uh, at this graph, uh, graph at this table, um, you can see that the majority of, of um, the most species rich countries are found in the old world, uh, with obviously the notable exception of the United States, which of course is one of the largest countries and therefore contains a very large number of species. But what is it, uh, useful is to look at the density of species, um, taking the country totals and obviously dividing them by the area of the countries. And when we do this, we see that the, um, the highest density of species very, very clearly can be found in the Eastern Mediterranean, generally in small countries bordering or in the Eastern Mediterranean region, um, with the top three being Lebanon, Cyprus, and Israel and the West Bank. Um, the only species which slightly break from this pattern uh, would be Armenia uh, and Austria, um, but generally the pattern is small countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, in terms of density, um, in North America, all of the states are too big, and so none of them get very high density scores. It would be interesting to see if a, a small 10,000 square kilometer part 
of say California could be could be found to see if a similar diversity um, similar to density measure could be found. Um, but at the moment, it's clear the East Mediterranean is where the greatest density of Andrina species can be found. Uh, in terms of a historical context, um, relatively few authors have described large numbers of Andrina species. If you take the 10 most prolific authors, they've described about 60% of, of Andrina diversity. I mean, if we take North America, then Cockerell, Virac, and LeBurge Le described um, over half. So there's generally a concentration of, given the size of the genus, relatively few workers describing a relatively large number of species. And uh, this work is, is ongoing, and it, it tends to be that it's pushed forward by few relatively large publications or uh, activity periods over a very short period of time. Um, and the process of description is, is very much ongoing. Uh, 2022, for example, was, was one of the most uh, productive years uh, ever in terms of Andrina description. And of course, this is a valid species, so this does not include species which have subsequently been synonymized. Um, this is uh, well illustrated by the, uh, this accumulation curve. So we basically have the cumulative number of valid species, not, not names. These are only valid species that are included. Uh, and we can see that basically there was a, a, a very big lull uh, until almost the end of the, the 19th century when, when very little work was done. We started, um, we can see here the, the monograph of Kirby from England. Uh, we can see Morovitz's uh, work on Central Asia, uh, Perez's work on, on the Western Mediterranean, uh, Virex's work in North America. Uh, and then we enter the, the period which was saw a very large amount of Andrina activity as we had Vanka, um, Leberge and Oshniuk all active at the same time. Uh, and then descriptions have basically continued at a, at a fairly steady rate until recently when there's been uh, a little bit of an uptick in the last couple of years. So we're nowhere near finished with the description of Andrina. Uh, a quick note, this obvious talk is obviously going to focus on the old world, um, but it's clear that there's a, a very large amount of outstanding work to be done in North America. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the fauna of the southwestern um, part of North America, um, but uh, it, it's clear if, if Andrina are anything, if they do anything similar in, in this part of the world uh, as they do in the Mediterranean basin, um, they're probably well over 100 species to describe. Um, in the paper of Minkley and Radke last year, oh, 2021, 35% um, of their Andrina species uh, were only identified to morpha species, uh, making estimates as to the extent uh, undescribed diversity in, in North America is, is very difficult. Um, and just to put it into context, um, since the uh, Goose and Lightning et al. update of 2005, I could only find two Andrina species described from uh, North America uh, in the same time period. Uh, nearly 200 species have just been described from the old world. So. Um, it would be fascinating to see uh, future research in North America. So in terms of what we need to consider when dealing with Andrina uh, is that we have this extreme, well, we generally a very young genus, only 25 million years old, hyperspecies, obviously evolving very, very quickly. In this context, there's relatively little time for substantial morphological changes uh, and adaptations to, to evolve and to accumulate. Uh, makes natural groups quite difficult to recognize, as we'll see in the, as you will see or have seen or heard in uh, the talk on subgeneric classification problems. And there are many barriers uh, which are limiting our ability to have a clean taxonomic outcome. So let's talk about, about these barriers and how they are being overcome, um, mostly focusing uh, on these five points. Um, Andrina faunas, most of them are local forms. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, historical and cultural barriers across study of bees in the old world that have limited our ability to have clarity. Uh, talk about and how Andrina love difficult to access parts of the world, how that is uh, uh, hindering our study. Um, I'd like to talk about how uh, functional change does not necessarily imply morphological change and 
why that presents problems in Andrina. And then I want to talk a little bit about Andrina as super adapters. Um, so if we take the, the West Mediterranean, um, I will be publishing this year large revisions to Iberia and Morocco. So I can speak about these two areas with the greatest confidence. Uh, Iberia has a, a fauna of 226 Andrina species. Uh, Morocco has 199, so faunas of roughly equivalent size. But there's actually relatively little faunal overlap. If you, if you add these two faunas together, you have 311 species. Um, but only about 37% of the species are found in both faunas. Uh, 112 of them are only in Iberia, and 85 are only in Morocco. And then if we look at genuine endemics, not just species found in one fauna but not the other, uh, you know, we have between 12 and 15% uh, endemic species. So uh, when you're learning uh, and working with uh, Andrina faunas, every fauna is a local fauna with its own peculiar quirks and endemic species, uh, which requires uh, a very large time investment in recognizing these uh, peculiarities. Uh, if we have Another example, this is uh, in the East Mediterranean to, to the Levant. If you compare the, the faunas of, of Turkey and, and Israel, uh, you have 450 species, uh, but only 30% are in common between these two areas. And it is not an enormous geographic distance. Um, so we have very, very high uh, turnover between regions, um, very high degrees of endemism. So as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's been a relatively um, small number of authors who've worked on Andrina, I guess, relative to the size of the genus. And this means that Andrina type material is usually concentrated in relatively few institutions. Uh, in Berlin, they have most of Frise's material. In, in London, uh, in Paris, they have uh, basically all of Perez's material. In St. Petersburg, all of Morowitz's material, et cetera. And so actually you need to, you, it's a good thing because you need to visit relatively few institutions in order to see a large number of types. But it's also meant when it was not possible to visit those collections, um, it's meant that workers have been working without access to a large number of names. Uh, in the case of uh, Klaus Warnke, who was the most prolific Andrina taxonomist, his collection was private for a very long time until he died. Uh, which made it extremely difficult for, for other workers, um, such as workers in the Soviet countries, to, to understand his species concepts. And obviously moving uh, between certain countries in the 20th century was very difficult, or sometimes difficult. And authors did not always consult all previous works, which of course is endemic to all study of bees. And so uh, this is particularly exemplified uh, in, in, in Asia, um, whereas uh, where in Turkey, you, you had study that was largely led by German speakers, Friede and Warnke. Uh, in Central Asia, you usually had studies that were led by Russian or, or Soviet workers. Uh, and then in uh, India and Pakistan, uh, you had study that was largely driven by British workers. And of course, you had Cockerell who, who went all over the place and unhelpfully described confusing names uh, from all of these regions. Uh, and of course, nobody really worked on Iran or Afghanistan. And so we have three essentially different cultural schemes producing names and not really consulting each other's works properly. Um, and so you end up with situations where certain species are described from, from Turkey by German speakers, and then they are described a second time independently from Central Asia. Uh, and of course, when you have the opportunity now to study material from across this range, uh, you start to find that, that many of the species have simply been described twice, as in uh, this particular case. So you have a species that goes across the dry parts of Turkey into the dry parts of Central Asia. Uh, you have a similar case. Um, this is a species called uh, Andrina hieroglyphica, which is described from the female. Uh, and Morovitz, uh, in his 1876 publication, often described species twice. He often described the female and the male uh, independently. He didn't always associate the sexes. Uh, and this is the, the, the male of the same species. So they're both uh, hieroglyphica. Importantly, note the, uh, the tooth at the base of the genera. Uh, and then independently, 
uh, we have uh, species described from Pakistan, and obviously uh, Nurse uh, was not at all a work of the uh, was not at all aware of the work of Morovitz from Central Asia, and so independently described Andrina Cara and Andrina Halictoides again describing the male and the female separately, and again the male uh, with the projecting tooth, or just with the projection at the base of the genna. Vanka then, uh, having inspected uh, the material of uh, Andrina Cara in London, uh, and having actually inspected Morovitz's material, but not having uh, joined these together, um, uh, independently uh, described a subspecies of Andrina Cara, saying, uh, if you look at uh, the figure here, that Andrina Cara, the male, has the projection at the base of the genna, and the specimen from Turkey is instead rounded. And therefore described it as a subspecies. And Osushniuk, having inspected Moravitz's material, uh, recognized that the male has a projection at the base of uh, Jenna, but she described uh, a different species which was simply rounded. And of course, what's happened is um, each of inspected a limited amount of material, and uh, we really just have two species that have been described six times. Uh, and so now we can synonymize these two names. Uh, Andrina Cara Minor, uh, unfortunately, is not actually an available name um, because it is, uh, is preoccupied. And so um, we finally end up with a position of clarity. We have Andrina Kurdiscanica going again across Turkey to the dry parts of Central Asia, and Andrina Hieroglyphica uh, from Iran, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Again, limited by um, insufficient access to museum collections, insufficient consultation of previous literature, and different workers working in different cultural uh, contexts. So, difficult to access places. Uh, again, we turn to the Middle East and to the Levant. And uh, this is one of the, the most productive places uh, for the uh, discovery and description of new Andrina species. As we go um, from, from the, the coastal areas of East Mediterranean, um, rising um, going across uh, the um, aridity gradient, as you go from the, the Mediterranean parts to the edge of the Syrian desert, uh, as we travel up into southern Turkey, which again uh, has this aridity gradient and has a similar habitat of, on the edge of the desert, uh, extending into southeastern Turkey, uh, into Turkish Kurdistan, uh, and then into the Zagros. In each of these areas, um, it uh, contains uh, similar bees um, that have, um, have formed uh, relictual isolated populations. If you uh, look in um, the area around Mount Hermon on the border between Israel, Lebanon, and, and Syria, uh, and if you look in the anti-Lebanon mountain ranges, uh, the arid habitats here host a fauna that is in common with um, these uh, other areas around Aleppo, around Urfa, uh, Hakkari province in eastern Turkey, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and into the Zagros Mountains. So all of these areas clearly in the past uh, had a shared fauna, some of which persist to today. But unfortunately, all of these areas, or at least many of these areas, are quite difficult to access. Almost nothing is, is collected in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, despite the fact that the Hakiri province in Turkey has an extremely rich fauna. It's clear northern Iraq will have a diversified fauna, um, but accessing it uh, is currently uh, too dangerous. Um, if we uh, zoom in on Mount Hermon, um, we, you can see uh, one of the reasons you have such a high density and diversity of Andrina species in, in the East Mediterranean is because there's an extremely sharp aridity gradient from the humid areas adjacent to the Mediterranean uh, going over to the Syrian desert. And this naturally creates a very, very large number of ecological niches and hence a high diversity of Andrina species. Um, because of the shared similarity, what you can often find is that species that are present in Iran will also be present in this area, in the Mount Hermon area, and in the uh, Syrian uh, and Lebanese anti-atlas. Uh, in this case, um, species from this species newly described from, from central Iran is, is also present uh, in Syria and in the Golan Heights. Uh, and uh, another example, 
Uh, this species was described from southeastern Turkey, so from Turkish Kurdistan, and then the Zagros Mountains uh, of, uh, of Iran, and it's also present in Lebanon and Israel at high altitude mountains. So even though we do have high species turnover between these regions, uh, it's imperative that one learns the entire regional fauna um, because species can have very widespread and isolated um, distributions. Uh, turning again to, to Central Asia, um, unfortunately, some of the greatest areas uh, where there is a lack of clarity, which is preventing um, preventing uh, different, it's preventing, it's preventing taxonomic clarity by inhibiting our ability to collect material across these regions. For example, being able to link the Iranian fauna to the Pakistani fauna means that many of the names of, of nurse and cockerel uh, are of uncertain placement because of the inability to collect new material. Uh, the Iran, Afghanistan, Baluchistan region obviously doesn't need an explanation as to why these is difficult to visit. Um, the, the gradient between Central Asia uh, and, uh, and Northern India, We're going through Kashmir uh, and the autonomous region of Tajikistan, uh, without material from these areas, it's impossible to connect the, uh, the names of, of uh, created by British workers and the names created by uh, Russian and Soviet authors. And Xinjiang also means that it's extremely difficult to join uh, the Chinese fauna to the Central Asian fauna at the moment. So I want to talk to you a little bit about functional change without morphological change. Andrina as a genus display relatively few adaptations for pollen harvesting. Uh, they mostly use morphologically simple flowers. Their niches are behavioral and temporal. And for bee groups that have clear adaptations uh, to collecting pollen, I would argue that this actually ironically makes them less flexible and, and adaptable to future change. So I want to go through some of these points and principles. Um, so Andrina, generally can, you might think of them as quite boring because they visit many generic, simple, open plants. Uh, if you're in any temperate area, you always know Andrina are going to be found at these simple flowers. Do not require any special ability, anything. A fly can come and visit these with no problem. Um, there are, I don't want to say there are no adaptations. If you take a group like um, Erodium, which is a member of the Geraniaceae, they have these very large pollen grains. And so many Andrina have evolved, well, not many, a few Andrina lineages have evolved to have special pollen collecting hairs. Uh, you can't see it fantastically, but there'll be a picture later uh, which illustrates this. They have long plumose hairs that allow them to uh, actually collect these very physically large for pollen grains, physically large pollen grains. So there are some adaptations, but generally as a rule, Andrina lack obvious morphological adaptations to pollen collection. Uh, and so you can have species such as um, this Andrina Borsan is a specialist to Brassicaceae. You find it across North Africa. Uh, you have um, this Andrina, Andrina, Kase, sorry, Andrina Kasia. Uh, there's no real morphological adaptation to, to using Brassicaceae or using Fabaceae in this case. Um, most Andrina fit into a fairly generic model. Um, and so if you look at a, an environment, such as this, this is a spring habitat in, in southern Morocco. You have your Andrina colonizing different niches um, behaviorally. Um, so this is a small Andrina, Andrina spalata, especially of brassicas, uh, Andrina isis um, on uh, Chicoriaceae, and Andrina mediovitata on, on uh, Asteroidea. So there's no real morphological, morphological adaptation in, in any of them. It's uh, it's mostly behavioral adaptation to collecting pollen from, from these individual uh, plant groups. And so I feel this is very well exemplified by the subgenus Tiny Andrina. Uh, Tiny Andrina is a Palearctic subgenus. Uh, there's one species in Eastern North America, Andrina Wokella, which is introduced. So it's not natively found in North America. And this group are, are strongly associated with 
uh, flowers of the Fabaceae. The Andrina casei I just showed is, is a Fabaceae specialist. And so if we turn to southern Spain, um, in southern Spain, they have an extremely high mountain, the, the Sierra Nevada, the original uh, Sierra Nevada, which reaches over 3,000 meters in altitude. And because it's in, in the south, in the Mediterranean, it's, uh, it's quite isolated from, from other mountain chains. And it's just, just marked here. And um, uh, if, you, if you look, there's a, an aridity gradient uh, from west uh, to east. It becomes more arid in the east. Uh, it has its highest peaks in the west. And as you move towards the east, it becomes, it becomes lower and drier. And so you have very, these hot and dry valleys. You have subalpine habitats, and you have and you have alpine habitats across the across the highest altitude. You go to the subalpine zone. You can find many uh, tiny andrina, um, typically visiting Fabaceae, morphologically corresponding to this widespread species andrina intermedia from Central Europe. If you go higher to the alpine zone. Uh, you can also find species morphologically corresponding to the to the intermediate group. Um, there's no real uh, there's no real difference. The morphologically, they're almost identical. Uh, simply uh, found at a slightly higher altitude. However, when you begin to examine uh, the male genitalia, you see very substantial differences. So these are uh, genitalia from. Um, from specimens taken from uh, on the left, the, the high altitude, the alpine zone uh, in the middle, uh, from the um, from the subalpine zone, and uh, on the right from the, the the dry valleys to the to the east of the Sierra Nevada, generally at less than a thousand meters, and we see very substantial change in in the genitalia, uh, even though the females are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to separate without uh, genetic or uh, context clues. And so seemingly without any, any change in the dietary niche, all of these species are associated with Fabaceae. Um, each uh, occupies a distinct altitudinal niche. Um, and uh, clearly there has been an interruption. Clearly there has been some kind of barrier to gene flow, which has occurred uh, in presumably a very short period of time. When uh, you make a, a phylogenetic tree, this is a, a phylogenetic tree based on um, the CO1 um, cytochrome C um, standard barcoding segment of, of the mitochondrial genome. Um, and here we have a phylogeny of the group and marked uh, here in purple. This is uh, Andrina intermedia from Central Europe. Andrina intermedia was described from uh, Sweden. And so this is the typical uh, this is the typical Central European uh, Northern European form. And then if we look lower in the phylogeny, um, we can actually see that the two uh, spec that two specimens uh, corresponding to Andrina intermedia uh, do not fall in the intermediate group. Instead, uh, one of them is more closely related to Andrina levanti, which is the low altitude uh, species, the species at less than a thousand meters in the dry valleys. And uh, one of them is more closely related to Andrina contracta, which is the species from uh, the uh, alpine zone in the Sierra Nevada. And uh, geographically, these two specimens come from different areas. One of them comes from the Sierra Nevada, the subalpine zone, and one comes from a different mountain range further north in Iberia. Uh, and so it's unclear what's happened here. It's unclear if there has been hybrid speciation, or it's unclear if uh, these simply are uh, in fact, not one species intermediate, but in, in fact, two different species, and that we've had uh, incredible adaptation to local area. Almost every single mountain range has multiple endemic species at different altitudinal, um, at different altitudinal um, layers. Again, without morphological change, except in the male genital capsule, the females are essentially identical. Um, this is not just restricted to mountains in Spain. We might expect that Mediterranean mountains are going to have um, an interesting uh, history, uh, having acted as glacial refugia during the Ice Age. It also happens just across most of Europe. Um, this is a map of another tiny Andrina species, Andrina avatula, which was described from England. Uh, and this is the distribution map presented by, by Klaus Warnke, who took a broad species approach and had one species present across uh, almost the entirety of Europe into Asia. 
However, uh, again, this is another phylogenetic tree based on, um, based on the CL1 gene. Uh, we can see that a uh, true androgen of Atula here is marked in red, and very, very strongly separated is a, is a cryptic species, uh, which uh, is called Andrina afcelia. And these two species um, were both described by Kirby. They were both described from, from England in 1802. And so for 220 years, these two species have, have been lumped together um, when they are uh, distinct. The females uh, are slightly more easy, uh, slightly more straightforward to separate, um, but the morphological differences are very slight indeed. Uh, this is uh, an updated distribution map. Um, showing how the two species are completely mixed together um, in Western Europe um, before uh, one of them stops and uh, Andrina F. Saliella, which is marked in red, uh, continues to the east. Morphologically, there are almost no differences, but ecologically, there absolutely are differences. Uh, this is a phenological plot. Um, so both of these species are, are bivoltine. Uh, on the on the x-axis, we have um, the year broken up into into uh, two week chunks, and uh, on the y-axis, we just have the percentage of observations. And hopefully, you'll be able to see that both species are bivoltine. But here in blue, we have Andrina vachli. We have a spring peak, and then a slightly smaller summer peak. And in Afcelliella, we have a spring peak, but it's a it's a later spring peak. They peak around the, uh, the end of May whereas a uh, Vatula peaks around the end of April. And again, we see the same thing where the second peak, the second peak of F. Saliella is delayed relative to the peak of Vatula. So we have two almost morphologically identical species, uh, but they have a different and distinct phenology. And they also have a distinct uh, ecological difference in the way they interact with Fabaceae and the way they collect pollen. This is Andrina Afzeliella in Spain. This is the summer generation. And as we'd expect for this group, it's visiting Fabaceae. And you can see it's visiting uh, herbaceous Fabaceae. This is Trifolium pretensi. However, uh, what Andrina Avatula does is it does not really visit uh, herbaceous Fabaceae. What it much prefers uh, is um, are members of the um, Genistae. So the Genistae is a different, um, I hesitate to say subfamily, I think it may be a tribe, it's a different phylogenetic grouping within the Fabaceae that tends to be um, woody, woody um, shrubs. Um, and hopefully what you can see it's doing is it's leveraging apart um, the, I always get, forget the terminology, is it the keel petals or the lip petals, but it's physically manipulating the Geniste flower in order to, to get at the anthers. And so when you start looking at Andrina ovatula, the much more Western distribution is because it's associated with the Geniste rather than herbaceous Fabaceae. And so no morphological differences, but there's a clear phenological difference and there's also a behavioral difference. So I would argue that it's extremely important to think as an ecologist uh, when considering Andrina, given the rapidity with which they evolve, given the, um, given the lack of morphological differences, um, many times they are distinct species, but this is only revealed uh, when you look at their ecology or phenology. If you are simply a, a morphological taxonomist with Andrina, you may struggle to see uh, the true differences that exist, which are expressed and cannot simply be observed uh, on pin specimens. Um, so I would argue they, they colonize these distinct niches. Uh, and I would also argue that behavioral changes can occur more rapidly in evolutionary time, which is partly what is facilitating their elevated rates of speciation. Since with these behavioral changes and these uh, phenological changes, they can colonize a wider variety of um, opportunities. Um, it means that if you want to comprehensively sample the Andrina fauna, you have to sample the during the winter. You have to sample at unusual times. You have to visit plants which are not typically considered to be bee plants, uh, such as wind pollinated plants. And you must sample every single mountain in the Mediterranean 
because there's a very high possibility that they will host uh, um, undersampled and unrecognized species. To, to give a few examples of this, uh, this is southeastern Spain. Um, this is uh, the province of Albacete. And what you can see on the, the pink is uh, erodium. So the Geraniaceae that I uh, showed earlier. Uh, and if you go to this very generic field, you can find many of these fields across southern Spain in the spring. Um, my colleague, um, Francisco Ortiz Sanchez, managed to collect this species, which uh, is, uh, it turns out, a specialist on, on erodium. You can hopefully see the, the branched, uh, multi, many branched plumos hairs here, and these are erodium pollen grains. So by visiting a, a non-classical bee plant, erodium, uh, in the spring, you can find new species almost anywhere in Southern Europe. Uh, this looks like a fairly, another fairly generic habitat in Iberia, uh, full of yellow brassicaceae, a very, very common sign in the Iberian or Mediterranean spring. Uh, but this photograph was taken in December, uh, which is not typically a time people um, go to Spain looking for bees. And here again, um, Javier collected uh, again a fairly generic, uh, this is a suandrina, which is a, a genus, members of which are specialized on brassicaceae pollen. However, when you observe the genital capsule, this is radically different from any of the Iberian species of suandrina. And so it's not doing anything special. It's just another suandrina that's specialized on brassicaceae, uh, but it's flying in December and it's colonized an unusual uh, time of the year. And currently this species is only known from uh, the city, uh, around the area of Cadiz. So um, very, very, very geographically localized. Then again, another example, slightly better understood, slightly better studied in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you get in the autumn uh, a bloom of, of, of autumn or winter herbs, um, such as crocus. And so there are many, uh, many species that fly in October, November, December uh, and uh, collect pollen from crocus. And so people putting out pan traps in, in Turkey were able to find, uh, again, another undescribed species captured at some point between October and January. Actually, I don't think it was a pan trap. I think it was a malaise trap. Um, but simply sampling at unusual times, uh, you're able to, to find uh, many, many undescribed Andrina because they have completely permeated the entire season and the entire year. So to, to, to sum up, um, some of these points, which I hope I've articulated and given you some food for thought. Um, dealing with this genus, Andrina form these extremely rich species communities uh, with high endemism and turnover, uh, resulting from their ability to adapt themselves to the local environment. Um, I would argue, because they lack morphological adaptations, this has made Andrina in evolutionary time, more adaptable. They've been able to, to change their phenology and change the host plants they're using uh, because they're not adapted to them. They can therefore switch more rapidly and easily. Um, there's a huge number of undescribed species remaining. Um, Andrina are unloved. And so <laughs> every museum will be stacked with unidentified uh, Andrina. Uh, and uh, I guarantee you, if you work on boxes of undescribed Andrina, you will inevitably come across undescribed species. Um, work is needed to join together different biogeographical bio regions. Um, it is ongoing, but it's um, extremely limited by uh, these um, difficult to access and difficult to sample parts of the world. Um, but eventually uh, there will be um, improved clarity uh, across these arid regions. And yeah, as Andrina colonized niches with great rapidity, uh, exhaustive searching is, is needed. Um, as a rule of thumb, I always say, if there's a plant which you don't expect there to be bees on, it's always worth checking uh, because Andrina will continue uh, to surprise. And uh, finally, um, for those of you who are more ecologically minded, keep thinking like an ecologist. Um, because of all of these uh, 
point. Um, Andrina, which morphologically may be indistinguishable, observing them in the field uh, will give you additional lines of evidence and additional clues that no, multiple, multiple species are present, cryptic species are present. And um, I would strongly argue that thinking like an ecologist uh, has been extremely informative uh, for clarifying Andrina ecology, and hopefully uh, can be used as a model for uh, current uh, and future workers on this um, highly, highly specious genus. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone has. That was great, Tom. You got me uh, kind of drooling to do some field work. I have been in the field since 2019 for a combination of viruses and old age. Uh, so that's great. Thank you. Um, there are questions coming in. Should, should I stop the stop the presentation or just? Oh no, I'm happy to keep looking at that picture in the background. Um, so the first one is from Chris Krusling. Uh, when a single species has two seasonal peaks, are these two different emergencies, or do individual females remain active but less so between peaks? So this would be two distinct generations. So they provision um, a brood in the spring and then die, and then that brood will emerge um, in the summer. So um, two distinct generations. And this, uh, there's been, am I right, fairly recently an issue with uh, some Andrina where the spring and the summer broods ended up being different species? Yeah, so if you take, um, if you take the Hollandrina, which is the group of Andrina labialis, um, in that group, uh, all of the species that were thought to be bivoltine are in fact, uh, the spring and the summer generation are different species. Um, but then if you take other groups like the Hoplandrina or the Micrandrina, um, the spring and summer generation have slight morphological differences, but they are actually the same species. So um, it's very group specific. All uh, right, that's it. That's really interesting. I, I don't want to monopolize the questions because there's a whole bunch coming in from other people, but I might come back to that. Uh, Gideon points out there's an exciting new manuscript by, whoops, hang on, things are moving on my screen, uh, about Andrina as early foragers. It's a preprint that's not been peer reviewed. So that's not a question, it's a comment. I don't know the manuscript he's referred to. Assume that's the, the paper by Carlos Herrera from the Sierra de yeah. Cazola. There's a link yeah. further down in the Q&A that I suspect is that. Maybe. Oh, right. There it is. It's Bio RxIV, which is to me a mysterious research outlet that people seem to be pre-publishing in quite often. Um, and in my role as an editor of a journal, the editor-in-chief commented whether we should be scanning bio RxIV to look for papers to attract to the journal. Uh, another question from Chris Kruisling, does floral behavioral niche specialization also occur in North America? Uh, yes, I mean, um, there's there's lots and lots of, of specialist Andrina in, in North America. Um, I was only able to study the uh, Andrina in Michigan. I spent two years there and generally, um, a niche, special, niche specialization is actually greater in, in North America, well, in Michigan Andrina than, than in oceanic um, Northwestern Europe. Generally, my, my rule of thumb is the more seasonal or, or arid it is, the shorter the flowering season, or the more seasonal, um, the greater the floral specialization. So um, in Southwestern North America, I'm, I'm sure most of the Andrina are specialists. Um, so they, I think Arnold Moldenki was one of the first to point out the pattern between aridity and an oligolecti in bees back in the 70s. He worked both in the, uh, the southwestern US and in Chile. Um, from Flor Rebergen, to what extent might physiological adaptation to pollen chemistry rather than morphology constrain diversification? Yeah, so absolutely. Um... It's a bit of a, it's still a bit of a black box, um, but I'm sure it, it must, there must be constraints. We know Asteraceae pollen is, 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 um, is difficult to digest 
Um, so when you look at Andrina clades that are specialized on esterase, yeah, I'm I'm 100 percent certain that, um, that that chemistry is constraining their choices. When I say that if you just have a morphology, if you just have a behavioral adaptation, you can just move between different clades, that's obviously not the whole picture. Um, uh, an Andrina on esterase um, uh, is subject to chemical limits, um, but I didn't I didn't want to touch on it in this talk for fear of making it, making it even longer. <laughs> oh, I could listen for another half hour easily. Um, from Stephanie Sandoval Arango, is there a database with photos of Andrina types? Um, there's a there's a there's a website maintained um, by the um, the Linz Museum in Austria, which has photographs of um, Vanka's types and the I think other types at, at the museum. Um, there are the Natural History Museum in London and the Smithsonian, I think, have type photographs which are on GBIF, um, but there's not there's not like a centralized depository um, of all Andrina types. It would be very nice if there was. Um, so there and there are some papers, for example, um, by uh, Yulia Astoforova and colleagues um, covering types from St. Petersburg. Um, so that's not a database, but. So there are photographs, but they're in a variety of places. All right, so next question from Brian Danforth. Tom, many Andrina have very low reproductive output. In many species, females often produce just six to eight offspring. Combined with the high endemism and narrow host plant specialization, I would think many Andrina are threatened or at risk. Can you comment on conservation status of Andrina in general? Big question. So I'm writing my I'm writing my Iberian revision at the moment, and I was I'm I was I sat down. And I was trying to think of these 226 species. How many are actually threatened in Iberia? And I actually it might be less than 10. Um, it's so hard to make an informed database decision as to how many of these species are threatened. Um, I mean, it, because many of them are floral specialists, it's in, it, obviously if you have floral specialists, they are, there's going to be a higher chance of being threatened. But um, it's, that's an easier question to answer in Northern Europe um, because we have plenty of data on the thermophilic floral specialists of Andrina in Northern Europe that have disappeared. Um, but it, it's very hard to answer it generally. It, 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 I can give you specific answers at specific scales, um, but it's absolutely, there will absolutely be threatened Andrina species. I just can't generalize that answer at the moment. All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Rufus Isaacs, you know him. Um, asks, if there were no financial or political restrictions, where would you be most motivated to visit for collecting Andrina to improve our understanding of its taxonomy? Oh, if I could go anywhere, it would be West Pakistan, it would be Baluchistan, but um, it would be the West Pakistan, uh, Southeastern Iran, because uh, there's some very weird stuff there. But um, Yes, too many political and um, practical considerations at the moment. Ah, yes, it would be great to get see some more bees from that part of the world, that's for sure. Uh, Dean Hoddat asks, well, says, thank you for a very interesting talk. Would you consider Andrina to be especially prone to endangerment or extinction due to their preference for restricted habitats? Maybe you kind of dealt with that already in your answer to Brian's question. I mean, if, if that one's very slightly easier to answer. I genuinely think Andrina are very robust because, I mean, so in answering very general terms, I think they're, they're actually not a particularly threatened bee group because they all nest in the ground. Many of them like early successional habitats. Many of them can, I get the impression, like, 
for example, the picture that's currently on the screen is um, is high step. It's about nearly two thousand meters. Uh, this is um, uh, to the to the east of the Middle Atlas in Morocco. So um, it's a very seasonal habitat. Uh, you get this short flowering period. Uh, this is this had snow in the winter. And you drive and there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you find this field and it's full of flowers and it's just trillions of bees. I just think, I think a lot of them are very robust and can actually deal with a lot of disturbance and a lot of seasonality. I think they're, they're so much more robust in my opinion than bumblebees or those kind of groups. So I think they're, they're, they'll survive more than other groups. So studying Andrina gives you a more optimistic view of life, which is very encouraging in these troubling times. Um, Joshua Sato, how does nest building design vary among Andrina species? Um, I can't answer that question. I'm a very terrible nesting ecologist. I don't really care about nests. Um, I should. Um, I just don't have time. Um, <laughs> there is some literature um people have particularly in some of the communal so there are for example some andrina for example in the subgenus hoplandrina which they're not social but they have kind of communal nest entrances um there is variation but i'm not qualified to answer that question variation in nest depth is one of them um Okay, from Robert Paxton, describing a new species requires knowledge of those that have already been described. So what can be done to improve access to species descriptions, for example, online resources? Um, well, quite a lot is gonna be done in, in the next two years. Um, one of the things that um, we're working on at the University of Mons is, is providing identification resources for European bees. So there's going to be an awful lot of photographs and identification sheets. And in the case of Spain and I and Portugal, there's actually going to be a I'm writing a key to the Andrina of that region. Um, in, so. So I guess the answer is um, uh, government funded programs can uh, support the creation of identification resources and um, uh, the currently funded project. Um, uh, which is called Orbit, which is being funded by the European Commission, um, could serve as a, as a model for that. Um, and the results of that will be online in about two years. All right. It's great that you're being able to do this and that the EU is, is funding this basic research. And that's really excellent. Um, Gideon points out, I would also mention that flight seasons seem to be extremely short for Andrina and new species can easily be missed. So yeah, you've got to visit, you visit all these mountain tops multiple times a year. Yeah, which is which is why when you look at places like this habitat, the, you know, the Moroccan interior, the Iranian interior, the interior of Central Asia, you've got to be everywhere all the time, basically. Like April is the best month for Andrina. You have to be everywhere in the Mediterranean basin in like a three week period. You know, this is why there are so many missed species. You, you need an Andrina SWAT team, a network of people to go out and collect Andrina all over the world in April. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, from John Plant, which subgenus or group of subgenus of Andrina is deemed to be the most ancestral? Uh, so it's what used to be called Melatoides, um, but true Andrina Melatoides is deep in the phylogeny. And um, so it's the group of Andrina Curiosa, which is a very fitting name, um, but it's currently undescribed. And um, if you um, listen to the talk by uh, Silas Bossett and Gideon Pesanti, I think they cover that. Yeah, I remember, and, and they did. The only Melatoides I've got in my collection are the, is the Melatoides, Melatoides, which is not one of the more early branches, as you just mentioned. Yes, it, it's very unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, taxonomies listed with unfortunate decisions. 
Uh, Joshua Sato, how do Andrina species overcome competition considering they rely on plants that do not require any particular specialization to access? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, they're like, if you, you can go to a field of Brassicaceae and, you know, you catch like 15 Andrina all specialized on Brassicaceae. Or, they're all seemingly on the same Brassicaceae and obviously other bees visited as well. Um, I guess, I guess the answer is, I don't know. I don't know how they, um, how they, how they deal with competition when they attack very generic resources. I, I guess the answer is often when they're using generic resources, they're often hyperabundant generic resources. So when you see a gargantuan field of brassicas, which will feel, you know, which will flower for like two or three weeks, it may not be possible to exhaust all of that pollen. I don't know. Um, certainly specializing on generic things, uh, very generic groups, um, I guess helps reduce reduce competition if they're very abundant. So, I, I, when you're doing your field work, do you find that uh, like a, a hyperabundant flowering of a particular plant actually makes it more difficult to find many bees? I, in Chile, where the rainfall is remarkably unpredictable, next to nothing for years, and then lots, you get the desert blooming. And it's actually more difficult to find bees often then than when you get a much less pronounced flowering. Do you find that with with your work? Yeah, it, it can happen absolutely. Um, uh, just trying to think of a good example. Um, yeah, I mean, for example, there's an um, ornithogallum, which is um, a spring flowering uh, monocotyledon. And um, I've been to a place where, actually, no, here we go, um, Cistus. I've been to, in Portugal and, and Spain, you get, you get hillsides that are covered with trillions of these big Cistus plants. And there are loads of Andrina, which are specialists on Cistus. And you can walk through it and you get like one per hundred flowers if you're lucky. So, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, it can be very hard to find um, some species, some specialists when there's hyperabundant resources. Fascinating. Um, you're getting lots of nice comments about your talk on the chat. I hope uh, you'll get a chance to see those. Um, it'll please the cockles of your heart. Uh, Paul Geisendorfer asks, how does climate change affect bivoltine and andrina species? And are there examples of univoltine species starting to get bivoltine? So I'll, I'll answer the second part of that question. So there are a number of what I suspect to be facultative bivoltine species. If you go to, and I'll use the example of Spain, if you go to Spain, there's a number of Brassicaceae and Asteraceae species that fly in the spring as normal. And then if they have autumn rains, they come out again in September, October, kind of usually in Eastern Spain, around Barcelona. And it's very hard to say if it's facultative or not because people don't collect in September and October. So I don't know if it's happening every year or only some years or they're less abundant or they've just not been collected as much. So it's possible that facultative bivoltinism exi exists. And how does climate change affect this? I guess it depends, it depends if, if it's facultative or not. Um, if you have obligate bivoltinism, then obviously um, climate change, which, for example, makes makes everything dry up too quickly. So a second generation would emerge and there's reduced flowers, then obviously it's going to reduce their fitness or it's going to shift the bivoltinism earlier and earlier into the season. So um, understanding how it's going to be affected by climate change depends on how intrinsic or flexible it is. Given what I've said about Andrina being super flexible, I'm just going to assume that they would be able to flexibly deal with the changing phenology, but we would need empirical data to establish that. Nice. Very nice. Um, I'm going to ask, there's no more questions up on the, on the uh, Q&A, so I, I've still got a couple. 
Um, the first one, you know, you comment, you know, look, to look at all of the flowers, even ones that don't seem very interesting, because eventually you'll find something. Um, you have to do that everywhere you find all of these things. And the example I'll give is uh, it's a Rofotine genus Microlectoides, uh, and there's a species Kinectidis that goes on Kinectis. And that's a flower that's abundant in the US Southwest. And I remember looking at it and thinking, there are never going to be any bees on that. And then I went to the type locality for, the, for Microlectoides, and every flower had one on it. And so you've got this bee that's a specialist on a particular flower, but there's obviously something else that's meaning that it's not often found outside of a relatively small geographic area. So that's just a comment. And the other one is, is that the, I'm little, it's interesting to me that you don't find adaptations to getting into those tight yellow um, Fabaceae flowers because uh, the genus of Desmia in South America, um, which also has tight flowers, um, there's multiple independent origins of, of a curved uh, in, a, in a hind tibial spur, which the bees seem to use to kind of get extra, extra um, purchase on the flowers to push their, ways in, their way in. There's, a, there's, there's musculature associated with getting there, which means that when most of these bees die, their head rotates upwards. Uh, because they have to push their way into the flowers. Um, there's facial uh, adaptations. Some of the species have got unusually flat or even concave faces. Um, and some of the larger bees, like some of uh, Mura cotiles that seem to specialize on them, they've got things that seem to reduce friction between the bee's head and the flower petals because they've got ridges along the clapeus or a remarkably smooth one. So, here in one group of flowers in one part of the world, multiple independent kind of convergent adaptations. And yet in, in this close, you know, you've got a closely related species pair where one is, you know, Ovatula is obviously very successful. And yet it seems to be able to get into the flowers without any adaptations whatsoever. It's very interesting to hear you mention flattened faces because a defining character of the tiny Andrina is that the clapeus is flattened. It's not kind of, you know, really obviously some kind of adaptation, but it, it, it is interesting. There doesn't seem to be a reason why per se they would have a flattened clapeus or not. Um, tiny Andrina are maybe eight to nine million years old. Uh, we would obviously need better age estimates, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just so many Andrina, Andrina are just generic. I mean, um, there's a couple of species that have kind of hooks on their, like hooked bristles on the galea for orangeaceae pollen, but um, yeah, tiny Andrina are just super generic. <laughs> There is, um, there's something which might be published later this year um, about one species of tiny Andrina, which is quite cool um, relating to its tongue. But, uh, but other than that, there's very little adaptation. It's, yeah, it's weird. All the, you have all the cool bees in, in South America and, and Andrina are just kind of generic, which is why you have to be an ecologist to find them interesting. <laughs> well, you have taken on a very complicated uh subject to study and it's obviously one that's going to keep you busy for a very long time so good luck to you oh, okay neither. so are there any more questions quickly to have something in the q a if you'd like me to ask tom a question for you otherwise we'll uh bring the seminar to a close uh, the next one on the last February, uh, sorry, the last February, the last Wednesday of February is going to be John Asher talking about global bee diversity, uh, global patterns of bee diversity. And then uh, after that, we've got, uh, who is it in March? I was thinking of it. Dr. Mann, I think it is. Oh, right. We got the origins of bees from, from apoid wasps from uh, Dr. Uh, San, who was the lead author on a couple of those papers looking at phylogeny of apoidia more broadly. So we've got a couple, you know, we've got 
some more great talks uh, coming up. Uh, somebody sent a chat saying, thank you, Packa Lab, for organizing this. I I'm sad to say that at the moment, the Packa Lab is pretty much me. Uh, I got one PhD student. My technician le left because he found a job that pays better. Um, so it's just me and a PhD student who's currently in Peru. But we get great help from Victoria, who is the coordinator for the research group of bee biologists at York University. So thank you, Victoria, for all your hard work on this. Great, and yes, thank you, Lawrence, for finding these speakers. I'm like Tom, yes, amazing job. So interesting. I love the photos too. So Yes, I encourage everyone to tune back in next month and for all the months going forwards. Again, check out yorku.ca slash bees slash packer um, to see the links to register. So link to register for the February talk is up now. Uh, the late, later, later talks will be up shortly. And this talk will be posted to YouTube probably this afternoon. And again, check out the YouTube uh, channel to you know share, subscribe, and keep keep track of what we're doing. So thank you all very much. Yeah, that was great, Tom. Thank you. Um, and I will eventually send you more bees from various parts of the world that are mostly Andrina. Happy to receive them. I have, we have a 